The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, Realizing a New Train of Thought, Essay 5, The Case for Human Unity. Quote, My country is the world, and my religion is to do good. End quote. Thomas Paine. A critical conclusion present in the logic that defines TZM's intention is that human society needs to unify its economic operations and work to align with the natural dynamics of the physical world as a single species sharing one habitat if we intend to resolve existing problems, increase safety, increase efficiency, and further prosperity. The world economic divisions we see today are not only a clear source of conflict, destabilization, and exploitation, the very manner of conduct and interaction itself is also grossly inefficient in a pure economic sense, severely limiting our societal potential. While the nation-state competition-based structure is easy to justify as a natural outgrowth of our cultural evolution, given the resource scarcity inherent historically and the long history of warfare in general, it is also natural to consider that human society could very well find purpose in moving away from these modes of operation if we were to realize that it is truly to our advantage as a whole group. As will be argued here, the detriments and inefficiencies of the current model when compared to the benefits and solutions possible are simply unacceptable. The efficiency and abundance possibilities extrapolated within TZM's intention to install a new socioeconomic system rest in part on a concerted effort by the human population to work together and share resources intelligently, not restrict and fight as we do today. Moreover, the social pressures and risks now emerging today around technological warfare, pollution, environmental destabilization, and other problems not only express a deeply needed gravitation for true global organization, they show a rational necessity. The xenophobic and mafia-like mentality indigenous to the nation-state today, often in the form of patriotism, is a source of severe destabilization and inhumanity in general, not to mention, again, a substantial loss of technical efficiency. False Divisions As noted in prior essays, the core basis of our survival and quality of life as individuals and as a species on the earth revolves around our understanding of natural law and how it relates to our method of economy. This premise is a simple referential understanding where the physical laws of nature are considered in the context of economic efficiency, both on the human and habitat levels. It is only logical that any species present in and reliant on the habitat in which it exists should conform all conduct to align with the natural orders inherent to that habitat, as best they can be understood at the time. Any other orientation is simply irrational and can only lead to problems. Understanding that Earth is a symbiotic, synergistic system with resources existing in all areas, coupled with the provably inherent underlying causal scientific order that exists, in many ways as a logical guide for the human species to align with for the greatest societal efficacy we find that our larger context as a global society transcends all notions of traditional cultural division, including having no loyalty to a country, corporation, or even political tradition. If an economy is about increasing efficiency in meeting the needs of the human population while working to further sustainability and prosperity, then our economic operations must take this into account and align with the largest relevant system that we can understand. So again, from this perspective, the nation-state entities are clearly false, arbitrary divisions perpetuated by cultural tradition, not logical, technical efficiency. Values The broad organization of society today is based on multi-level human competition. Nation states compete against each other for economic, physical resources, corporate market entities compete for profit, market share, 
and average workers compete for wage providing occupations, income, and hence personal survival itself. Within this competitive ethic is a basic psychological propensity to disregard the well-being of others and the habitat. The very nature of competition is about having advantage over others for personal gain and hence Needless to say, division and exploitation are common attributes of the current social order. Interestingly, virtually all so-called corruption, which we may define as crime in the world today, is based upon the very same mentality assumed to guide progress in the world through the competitive interest. It is no wonder, in fact, given this framework, that various other detrimental, superficial social divisions are still pervasive, such as race, religion, creed, class, or xenophobic bias. This divisive baggage from early fear-oriented stages of our cultural evolution simply has no working basis in the physical reality and serves now only to hinder progress, safety, and sustainability. Today, as will be described in later essays, the possible efficiency and abundance producing methods that could remove most all human deprivation, increase the average standard of living enormously, and perfect public health and ecological sustainability greatly, go unembraced due to the older social traditions in place, including the nation-state idea. The fact is, there is technically only one race, the human race. There is only one basic habitat, Earth, and there is only one working manner of operational thought scientific. Origins and Influence Let's quickly consider the root origins of the competitive, divisive model. Without going into too much detail, it is clear that the evolution of society has included a vast history of conflict, scarcity, and imbalance. While there is debate as to the nature of society during the period of time preceding the Neolithic Revolution, the Earth since that time has been a battlefield where countless lives have been taken for the sake of competition, whether material or ideological. This recognized pattern is so pervasive, in fact, that many today attribute the propensity for conflict and domination to an irreconcilable, impulsive characteristic of our human nature, with the conclusion that the human being is simply unable to operate in a social system that is not based upon this competitive framework, and any such attempt will create vulnerability that will be exploited by power abuse, expressing this apparent competitive dominance trait. While the subject of human nature itself is not the direct focus of this essay, let it be stated that the empirical power abuse assumption has been a large part of the defense of the competitive divisive model, using a general broad view of history as its basis for validity. However, the specifics of the conditions in those periods, coupled with the known flexibility of the human being, are often disregarded or ignored in these assessments. The historical pattern of conflict cannot be considered in mere isolation. Detailed reference to the conditions and circumstances are needed. In fact, it's likely accurate to say that the dominance conflict propensity which is clearly a possible reaction for nearly all humans in our need for self-preservation and survival in general, is being provoked by pressures rather than being the source of any negative reaction. When we wonder how the massive Nazi army were able to morally justify their actions in World War II, we often forget the enormous propaganda campaign put out by that regime, which worked to exploit this essentially biological vulnerability. True self-interest. The notion of self-interest is clearly inherent to the human being's common urge to survive. This is obvious enough and it is easy to see historically how the raw necessity of personal survival, often extending to family and then the tribe or, or community, set the stage for the divisive protectionist paradigm we exist in today. It should have been expected from the standpoint of history that vast economic theories would also be based upon the notion of competition and inequality, such as in the work of Adam Smith. 
considered the father of the free market, he made popular the assumption that if everyone had the ethic to look out for themselves only, the world would progress as a community. This invisible hand notion of human progress arising from narrow personal self-interest alone might have been a semi-workable philosophy many years ago when the simplicity of the society itself was based on everyone being something of a producer. However, the nature of society has changed greatly over time. With population increases, entirely different role structures, and exponentially advancing technology, the risks associated with this manner of thought are now proving to be more dangerous than beneficial, and the true definition of self-interest is taking a larger context than ever before. Is it not in your self-interest to protect and nourish the habitat that supports you? Is it not in your self-interest to take care of society as a whole, providing for its members, so that the consequences of deprivation, such as crime, are reduced as much as possible to ensure your safety? Is it not self-interest to consider the consequences of imperialist wars that can breed fierce, jingoistic hatred on one side of the planet, only to have, say, a suitcase bomb explode behind you at a restaurant as a desperate blowback act of retribution? Is it not self-interest to assure all of society's children have the best upbringing and education so that your future and the future of your children can exist in a responsible, educated, and increasingly productive world? Is it not in your self-interest to make sure industry is as organized, optimized, and scientifically accurate as possible so that we do not produce shoddy, cheap technology that might perhaps cause a problem in the future if it fails? The bottom line is that things have changed in the world today and your self-interest is now only as good as your societal interest. Being competitive and going out for yourself, beating others only has a negative consequence in the long term, for it is denying awareness of the synergistic system we are bound within. A cheaply made nuclear power plant in Japan might not mean much to people in America. However, if that plant was to have a large-scale technical failure, the fallout and pollution might make its way over to American homes, proving that you are never safe in the long run unless you have a global consciousness. In the end, only an Earth-humankind conscious view can assure a person's true self-interest and hence, in many ways, also assure our society's evolutionary fitness. The very idea of wishing to support your country and ignoring or even enjoying the failure of others is a destabilizing value system. Warfare. The days of practical warfare are long over. New technology on the horizon has the ability to create weapons that will make the atom bomb look like a Roman catapult in destructive power. Centuries ago, warfare could at least be minimized to the warring parties overall. Today, the entire world is threatened. There are over 23,000 nuclear weapons today, which could wipe out the human population many times over. In many ways, our very social maturity is being questioned at this time. Battles with only sticks and stones as weapons could tolerate a great deal of human distortion and malicious intent. However, in a world of nanotech weapons that could be constructed in a small lab with enormous destructive power, our expanded self-interest needs to take hold, and the institution of war needs to be systematically shut down. In order to do this, nations must technically unify and share their resources and ideas, not hoard them for competitive self-betterment, which is the norm today. Institutions like the United Nations have become complete failures in this regard because they naturally become tools of empire building due to the underlying nature of country divisions and the socioeconomic dominance of the property, monetary, competition-based system orientation. It is not enough to simply gather global leaders at a table to discuss their problems. The structure itself needs to change to support a different type of interaction between these regional groups where the perpetual threat inherent between nation-states is removed. In the end, there is no empirical ownership of resources or ideas. 
Just as all ideas are serially developed across culture through the group mind, the resources of the planet are equally as transient in their function and scientifically defined as to their possible pur purposes. The Earth is a single system along with the laws of nature that govern it. Either human society recognizes and begins to act and organize on this inherent logic or we suffer in the long run.